Egyptomania gripped Europe in the 19th century, beginning with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798 and continued after every further archaeological discovery. And the biggest fascination with these discoveries were mummies. In a very colonial state of mind, the Europeans desecrated the buried dead of the Egyptians, trying to find lost treasures and relics. And this was not just a passion for archaeology students or Egyptologists. Pretty much everyone got into this new trend. By the 1830s, the upper classes were flooding to Egypt on holiday to search for their own antiques and souvenirs. Remember, this was a time when people would just walk into Egypt and pick up the Rosetta Stone and take it home to show their friends. The advertising marketed the allure of the exotic and mysteries of the Orient. Mummies were the jackpot prize, and it got to the point where nobody wanted to return home without one. The Egyptian society established in 1741 were just a group of British men who owned their own private collections of ancient Egyptian artefacts. It was purely an amateur hobby in this time, that is, amateur for people rich enough to obtain these artefacts. The Egyptian tourist industry was booming, but at a great cost to their historical past. In fact, demand was so high that mummies could be transported to the more popular spots where tourists would go to ensure that all the visitors would be satisfied with their trip to see or acquire an authentic mummy. But what were they being used for? A lot of these mummies found their way into personal collections and interior decor being displayed in homes, not always in one piece. Almost like our here's a picture of my trip to Egypt was their mummy in the corner that would preserve as a memory of the trip. But it was worse than that. They also used the mummies. Up until the 19th century, some would often consume mummy flesh, bone and blood as medicinal cures. So it wasn't such a large leap that Europeans believed these embalmed bodies had magical healing powers. The mummia, which included the stuff that the mummies were wrapped in. This could be applied to the skin or powdered into drinks and supplements. This could be used to heal bruising, wounds and a range of other maladies. Ancient writers like Pliny the Elder wrote that embalmed mummies would offer healing powers. Mumia was so popular that there was even a black market and trade in fake mummies. These were falsely created mummies with the bodies of animals, criminals and beggars, but were passed off as ancient mummified bodies. This was in order to keep up the demand of these commodities. They were also used for art. A pigment of paint called mummy brown was used since the 15th century, at least up until the late 19th and actually it contained, you guessed it, ground up mummy. Apparently it was often used for shading and flesh tones, but we can only speculate which paintings it was actually used in or not. These priceless relics were also used as fertilizer. Many of these mummies discovered were in fact animals, and these mummified remains proved very useful for the agriculture industry, who used this new resource as a fertilizer. In one account, a single company purchased 180,000 cat mummies, which were grounded and spread on their fields to promote healthy produce. And there is an argument that after the boom in the use of paper products, some paper mills imported mummy wrappings as material for paper. And this is disputed among scholars, but it just goes to show how plentiful these mummies were in the 1850s. One of the most crazy things that these mummies were used for was purely entertainment. Known as an unwrapping party, aristocrats and upper classes could hold these scholarly gatherings where they basically unwrapped the carefully preserved mummy remains. This trend came to be after 1821 when an antique salesman, Giovanni Belzoni, held a public mummy unwrapping exhibition in Piccadilly Circus attracting huge crowds. The unwrapping itself appealed to the macabre interests, but offered as an intrigue to discover what else could be found in the wrappings, such as amulets and talismans. Now, these weren't as popular now that everyone could claim to have attended such events, but an invitation to one was not uncommon. Some academics did use these mummies to study and research the past, 
knowing that these artefacts were real human beings and reflected so much of their time and place in history. But studying them for academia and using them as entertainment were far different things. It was in the 19th century that we do finally see the changing attitudes towards these preserved antiques as opposed to things to be used as products and disposable objects. These were humans, not only to be held secrets and provided knowledge of the past, but also demanded respect just as anyone buried in a cemetery. However, it did take a while for this to be observed. Even in 1900, an account that the tomb of the Pharaoh de Gere was discovered, and although the jewellery was carefully preserved, his arm was thrown away. Some of these mummified remains was also passed off as remains of other relics. A human rib from an ancient Egyptian mummy was passed off as a remain from Joan of Arc, for example. It was displayed in a museum until they did forensic tests to prove that it actually predated her existence. And these artefacts were used to raise money, such as an Egyptian mummy that is on display at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where people paid about 25 cents to see the first complete human Egyptian mummy in the US in 1823. This relatively unknown person was exhumed from their resting place, shipped over to this unknown land that they would never have known existed when they were alive, and given as a gift to the city of Boston, and actually helped save this hospital and remains there to this day. These mummies were seen as spiritual items and often thought to have magical protections following them. Since Howard Carter's discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922, and the tragic death of many members of his team, the rumours of mummy curses began to spread. The sponsor of this exhibition, Lord Carnarvon, soon died suddenly, as did six of the 26 present at the tomb opening. Though this was within a decade of the discovery, and Lord Carnarvon's death was attributed to a mosquito bite. But still, people love a cursed story. These superstitions long outdated Carter's discovery. Even in the 16th century were tales of mummies being transported across the seas, creating deadly storm waters, and doomed those who travelled with mummies in their possession. This did not stop the demand for them, however, and as laws to control the trade in antiquities increased, the black market only became more efficient. At the end of the day, these commodities were people, deceased people, who were laid to rest, presumably in peace. Now, here is a controversial question. Thank goodness we have stopped grounding them up for medicine, but is it any different that we keep these mummies on display in museums around the world for both scholarly and entertainment purposes? Or should they be returned to their resting place in Egypt to be left in peace? Subscribe down below and let me know what you think was the most disturbing use of mummies. For me, it's got to be ingesting them. Thank you for watching and goodbye for now.